Do you want the camera to be adjusted? Oh. Yeah, we've got a little bit too much headroom. Do you mind? That's good. Yeah. And we're live, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the WAN Show. Luke is cavorting about in Asia, so he couldn't join us, but that's okay. We have budget Luke. Sorry, is it discount? It's discount, it's Luke. discount Luke. Sorry. Cavort. <laughs> Jump or dance around excitedly. I hope he's cavorting. Yeah, oh, I'm pretty sure he's cavorting. He loves hanging out over there. I'm pretty sure that's the only reason that he wanted to go to Computex. It's, Luke, if you're watching, I'm on to you. It's the only time he cavorts. Yes, the only time he cavorts. <laughs> I rarely cavort, but when I do, it's in Asia. He actually can't really cavort over there because a lot of the time the ceilings are too low. Oh, I thought you were going to say he would like squish people. Like, yeah, that's like, true. Like step on them. Like, yeah, little aunts. Yeah, yeah, he really does stand out there. In a, <laughs> Get back, I'm cavorting. In a very real way. So, uh, yeah, we've got a really great show for you guys today, and I'd love to tell you about it, except my uh, laptop is updating. So maybe James can tell us what some of the great topics we have are. We're going to talk about our favorite things from WWDC. I actually do have some favorite things from <laughs> WWDC. Like, not everything was bad. Okay, so. no spoilers, though. Okay. And remember when YouTube was down last weekend? We do, remember when <laughs> the WAN show was supposed to go up last weekend? There's lots of things. Conspiracy. <laughs> and AMD and Samsung partner up for ultra low power graphics in possibly mobile phones. All that and more. At 11. News at 11. Roll the intro. Mm -hmm. This is great. I just like the timing. Uh, someone messages, oh. how rich is Linus in the chat? And someone super chats, 99 cents. <laughs> Not so actually, rich that he doesn't appreciate this. It's actually less than 99 cents because YouTube takes a cut of that. Oh, they take a cut of super chats? Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course they do. Of course they how do. much? It's not like 30% or something. Like Seven? Uh, no, no, I think it's more than that. Yeah, I actually don't know. Super chats, um, while we definitely appreciate people's generosity, um, are not really a needle mover for us. Um, and part of it is that YouTube does take a significant portion of it. So Super Chat, uh, YouTube portion. Sorry, I have to look this up because I actually don't know. How much money does YouTube take from Super Chats? This is an article on Stream Geeks, and I should probably be looking it up on my laptop now that it's um, not updating anymore, and then I could actually share this with you. How much... I thought we were directing all the Super Chats to Brandon now. From super... Yeah, no, no, that was just that one time. Hey, yeah, Brandon, you got your free lunch, right? Yeah. Okay, good, right. just checking. Those super chats move the needle for you? Um, Guys, please continue super chats, please. He got, he, got a free, he got a free lunch out of it, so that's pretty good, I guess. Nice. All right, how much money does YouTube take from super chats? Wow, this is a really long article for just like... Search on dollar sign. A or formula. Search on percent. Yeah, control F. Uh, you have seen our 100% YouTube live super chat, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay, when I clicked the estimated revenue in YouTube's analytics, it was roughly 30% less than the total Super Chat amount. Um, so they take a 30% cut of Super Chats through YouTube. <sighs> That's exorbitant. Well, yes and no. It's exorbitant. Hold on a second. Yes and no. It's not quite that simple because for one thing, Google, while they do use their own payment processor, which saves them a lot, um, if they were using a third-party payment processor, you could be looking at as much as 30 cents or more per transaction, plus a percentage of the transaction. So even if I was just uh, using Stripe or Braintree to take a dollar from you over the internet, thank you very much, I would still be giving 30% of that, over 30% of that to my payment processor. This is something that we've learned the hard way um, as we've uh, developed Floatplane. Uh, Luke's not here, so we're not going to talk about Floatplane a ton today, but uh, you know, my apologies to the Floatplane fans out there. Only blockchain can save us. B well, save us, blockchain. Yeah, but the transactions aren't even free f with crypto. Like Some well, cryptocurrencies depends. have very high transaction fees, especially if depends. you want the transaction to go through in a reasonable amount of time. Yes, I know it depends, but the some of the more commonly used ones have extraordinarily high transaction fees. Whatever, man. It's the future. <laughs> All right. It's, it's hard to have a real conversation, but then, I mean, you don't cost as much as Luke, so. 
<laughs> discount conversation. I don't. Okay, no one wants to have a blockchain conversation right now. I just wanted to make the joke and okay. leave it at that. Okay, that that's fair. You know, um, Bitcoin's up what like sixty percent this year though. Uh, last I checked, it was. Is it like ten grand? I don't. I don't know. Honestly, I'm like. See, now we're having a blockchain conversation. I'm. I'm out. It's eight grand. It's eight thousand U.S. dollars. So I'm. I'm out. I don't care anymore. So I'm. I'm actually trying not to pay too close attention to it. I'm just like, you know what? Forget it. You guys enjoy your crypto thing. Call me when it's actually manageable to integrate as a payment system. Uh, call me when you know the Canadian banks and the Canadian government have all decided on a way to uh, deposit and withdraw this stuff and uh, not have everything disappear mysteriously in a weird town in India where people are known for going to fake their own deaths. Mm. Um, you, you heard about that, right? That specific one, no. Um, so uh, what's the uh, what's the crypto exchange that went down? Uh, the one that was like based out of here. Oh, uh, what was that called? I don't know. They all have the same name. Oh, <laughs> uh, out of business owner died. Hold on. What was it? Quadriga. Yeah, Quadriga. Um, so it's a 30-year-old CEO and co-founder died of complications arising from Crohn's disease while traveling in India, supposedly, except the circumstances of his death. Um, or spurious. Are, yeah. But, but did that ever come to a conclusion? I don't believe it has at this point, but I haven't been f paying really close attention to it because, like I said, I'm out. I hope he's alive. <laughs> I really do. I, <laughs> like, over $100 million of assets. Like, are you saying you've never fantasized about sh faking your own death? It's just such a funny thing to think about. Like, it's illegal as far as I know, isn't it? I think it is. Yeah. I mean, you know, the thing is that, you know, most of the people uh, who do it, you know, never get prosecuted because they're actually dead. I love how there's like a mecca for this, like, if you want to fake your death, come here. How can you have a good fake <laughs> if everyone knows, oh, he died in that town? Well, no one really dies there. Like, their whole newspaper's obituaries, like, <laughs> fake news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. Like, there's a place. There's a place there. I forget what the town is called, or like, like the area is called. But they're really well known for document forgeries, including things like birth certificates and death certificates. And that happened to be. And this could be a tinfoil hat conspiracy theory. In fact, YouTube chat is probably blowing up, being like, oh. I personally. Oh wow, it is blowing up. Like, I personally saw the dead body or whatever. Like, good for you. Uh, so, yeah, like I said, it's possible this is all nonsense. It's a but, hub for makeup artists. Um, but it's it's possible. Someone says not illegal. You have the right to disappear. Yeah, you can disappear, but you can't, um, you can't forge a death certificate because that is a legal document. So that would be about, like, forging a, um, a, a, a land deed. Like, you, you can't do that. And because there are such large incentives for some people for faking their own death, um, it, it, there's definitely, definitely laws that uh, make it so you, you can't do that. Faking your death is sometimes called pseudocide. Pseudocide. That is great. I like that. That's, That's cute. Fantastic. That's clever. Wow. Well, don't know if it's illegal or not yet. How about Apple stuff? How about it? How about it? All right. Well, why don't we why don't we bring up the WWDC news and kind of kind of talk through some of go our the favorite things. The WAN doc. Why would I go to the WAN doc? There's links therein. I know, but the people who work on that they just don't do a very good job. It's funny because he's the one who works on the WAN doc. Uh, all right. All right. All right. All right. So th there's like nothing in here. I said follow the links. The links. You are, I didn't build this out because you already made videos about this. You know this. We all know this stuff. All right. So should we start with the Mac Pro? Now, I've kind of said everything that I want to say about the Mac Pro. Um, I, there, oh, actually, I do have a couple small corrections from the video that I made earlier this week. So I had speculated that the the very low end system configurations that only have four sticks of memory mm -hmm. might not support six channel memory. Right, but I remember that. Right after the Mac Pro announcement, uh, we missed it. Intel announced their 3000 series Xeon W lineup that was going to be the processors in the Mac Pro, and it does go all the way down to eight cores, and Apple apparently confirmed that no, there will only be one motherboard. So they're just shipping a six-channel motherboard 
six channel CPU and they're just putting four sticks of memory in it because six grand for eight an eight core processor makes a ton of sense or something. Now, from like an optimization standpoint, what, yeah. what does that mean? Is... Um, it means that you're getting effectively 66% of the memory bandwidth that you otherwise would. Now, with that said, you've only got a piddly eight core processor, so pff, who cares, I guess, because it's not like, uh, it's not like a, a 28 core where you could legitimately have a workload you're running on it that needs all of that memory bandwidth. Like you just don't have the compute to justify it anyway. But I also just don't think that an eight core configuration of this machine should exist. It doesn't make sense. Like so much of the price of this thing is making up for the R&D of the case design, it seems to me, that you're just not getting any value on the, on the low end. On the low end, I think there's people already defending it, but I don't, I don't understand these people because on the low end, you should just be buying a latest gen iMac. It has an eight core processor. Hmm. ECC memory is a really, it's a really interesting feature because I even went as far. So we published a very negative review of Intel's previous uh, Xeon W lineup, the one that was based on their LGA 2066 platform. And what Anthony and I concluded, and I ultimately said in the video, was these things are a rip. Buy an HEDT processor because the only differentiating factor is that they support ECC memory, which if you really needed it, well, AMD supports ECC up and down their entire lineup. Oh, wow. All the way from Threadripper down to Ryzen 3. So if you absolutely must have that, there might be an AMD option for you. Go check that out. And you lose overclocking support, which depending on oh, your workload might actually make sense because you're using their C620 whatever chipset instead of their X299 chipset, which has overclocking support built into it. So we ultimately concluded that you were paying anywhere from 500 and over dollars for a, a trade-off in features that may or may not have any value to you. And um, Intel was upset about my conclusion because they said, well, actually, you know, Xeon W is good for workstations. And I went, why is it good? And they said, well, because it's made for workstations. And I said, well, what makes it made for workstations exactly? And they said, well, it has ECC support. And I said, well, that's nice. Um, what does that do for me? Because here's the thing, the perception for a lot of years was that Intel Xeon processors were somehow better than their consumer equivalents. And there have been times when they actually were. But over time, the R&D cost to make a new CPU design has become such an enormous part of the cost of a processor that by the time you've done all that R&D, it's actually cheaper to just make the same CPU and put it under two different brands with some features turned on or turned off. And a feature that you would turn off would never be stability. <laughs> like it is not, think about it. It is not in Intel's interest for their core series processors to crash once every 422 hours. For, to what end? Mm. So Intel can talk about how Xeon W is really stable. But if you ask, well, is Core i9 not stable? They just kind of, yeah, it's stable. And it is. So what I asked them to do was, okay, guys, let's talk about ECC. I want to do a video where you guys take me to like, uh, you know, Sandia National Lab or something, and and we 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 simulate a solar a solar event. We we flip a bit. We actually flip a bit on a memory chip, and show that this system recovered from it and this one didn't. And they were like, we can't do that. Like they physically can't do that? They don't have the instruments to do that? They wouldn't clarify. Okay. They were just like, we can't do that. And so I said, well then, my conclusion about your processor, given that there is no meaningful demo. I also, I, before we got as far as like going to a laboratory and like doing this, um, 
I asked, well, give me a demo. Mm -hmm. Give me something I could do on these two machines that shows that this one is more stable than this one. And they were like, we don't have any workload like that. I kind of went, okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, like the thing you got to understand is that ECC does do something. In the event of an accidental bit flip, it is supposed to recover from it. The thing is that each subsequent generation of DDR technology has also added more resiliency against accidental errors. So I'm not saying it doesn't have a value today. I'm just saying that it's not a value that even Intel was able to design a test for me to be able to demonstrate. Um, so it's the people I talk to there. If anyone from Intel is watching and knows a way that we can do this, yo, HMU, as the kids say, right? I'm almost as old as you now, man. Yeah, well, fair enough. Yeah, and you're going to be, uh, wait, is that public knowledge or no? Yes. Oh, okay, and he's going to be a dad, too. Yeah. He's going to be the second dad at Linus Media Group. I was going to say second parent, but my wife works here. She's yeah. also a parent. That's true. She's very obvious. She's, yeah, Get she it? is. She's a parent. Oh, that was great. Oh, let me, I'm going to let that wash over me for a second. <laughs> yeah, so it's like a feature that is over-serving most people and being disrupted by the same company's other features. Yes. Anyway, um, I forget where I was going with this. Right, you should just buy an iMac because it's a faster <laughs> eight core. Even thermal throttling, I think it's still faster than this, uh, this Xeon W because... Uh, whatever or something. Um, and then that even ignores the iMac Pro, which starts at five grand. And uh, I think, what does, what does its core count start at? I feel like we need to go like look at that now. iMac Pro, Apple, USA. I don't think this is gonna take me to the US site. No, it's not. Well, whatever, we'll just do it manually. Thank you very much for that. Oh, the prices? I love how this stuff is automatic. You don't need the prices automatic. right now. No, I do need the prices because so the, the Mac Pro is going to start at six grand. So if we have a look at where the iMac Pro starts, because remember, these are not the same processors. They fit in an entirely different socket. But from a performance standpoint, I don't believe Intel has changed anything. Like I, clock speed for clock speed, core for core, they should be quite similar. So let's go ahead and have a peeky boo at what we get for this. So we get a 3.2 gigahertz uh, Xeon W that turbos to 4.2. And what do we get with the Mac Pro? We get a 3.5 that turbos to 4.0. So let's configure it. We've got a grand to spend because they both come with 32 gigs of RAM in the base configuration. And uh, two f no, this one has a one terabyte SSD out of the box. Of course it does. Right, so we can add another two freaking cores. And I'm not saying the iMac Pro is a perfect machine. I'm just saying it also happens to include a display. Um, <laughs> With a stand. And it'll outperform the base model Mac Pro on paper. We will have to actually test that. We might have to crack open our iMac Pro again. Oh, stop cracking it. Put like different processors stop, in Stop it cracking stuff. it, please. Oh, I know. I know. And just, oh man, the, I think the graphics card is the most embarrassing thing about this stock configuration. Really, a 580X. Let's fire up Lenewegg.com. Now, I know it's a Radeon Pro or whatever, but you guys got to understand, that is a... Is that, that just been that better? Is a, that, no. That is just a driver switch that AMD flips. Oh, it goodness. is the same bloody card. Um, 580X. Hold on You're a second. You're not typing. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. So what does a 580X cost these days? Here's an MSI armor, whatever, $200. <laughs> like, we're talking a, a $200 graphics card in a system that costs six grand. So basically, the message that Apple is sending with this base configuration is buy this if you're the kind of, like, ego, images everything moron that wants to have a Mac Pro as a status symbol, but actually doesn't care at all about what's under the hood of it. At all. Yeah. That's the message. It's like being like, oh, I need a Mercedes to impress the ladies. And everyone else is like, yeah, it's the cheapest one. Yes. But as long as the ladies don't know that, I guess yeah. you're good. Then you're good. So as long it's as you're It still grates cheese. Ladies who aren't into cars. 
Um, what what else did I did I want to say about the Mac Pro? Right. Okay. So we know it's all the same socket. So. Um, no, you don't get a different motherboard, it's just stupid. Now, I've had people say, well, what if you want to upgrade in the future? Well, then you should use your current machine for now, and you should upgrade when you order. Because upgrading computers is very rarely a good idea. Now, I'm not saying you should get the, you know, most loaded out memory configuration. In fact, there's a good chance that companies like OWC or iFixit are going to have kits that you can use to upgrade that stuff for much cheaper. Um, I'm just saying that you're basically buying a processor that you then are just going to put in a bin. And trust me, no one else is going to want it because the kind of motherboard that's going to fit an LGA 3647Z on W is going to cost $500, $600. Nobody buys a board like that and puts a cheapo eight core processor in it. That's stupid. It's an imbalanced machine. That's my point. It's six grand. It's got a throwaway processor, a throwaway graphics card and memory that Honestly, let's see, it's 32 gigs, so what is that? Is that eight gig sticks? So that limits your total upgradability as well because it's only got 12 memory slots. So 32 times three is what, like 96? 96 gigs of RAM, like that's probably lots, but you're better off getting 16 gig sticks because that doubles the overall expansion. Like if, if upgradability is what you've got in mind, don't buy parts that you have to throw away and that no one will ultimately want. So why do you think Apple makes this skew? They make this skew for the, for the ego people. So like, like, do you think yeah. it's, it's their most profitable build out? No. No, I think they're but absolutely- But it's, it's just because people will buy it? I think that they are trying to maintain not just a profit margin, but also a GP dollars profitability to this product because my What do you mean by GP dollars? Uh, gross profit dollars. Okay. So So they just want to have coverage as, as wide a swath of the market as possible. Yeah, so so they want to hit the lowest price point they can while still making what they would have expected to make regardless of which SKU they sell on the core components that they're selling, which are ultimately the case, a license for Mac OS, yeah. which is ultimately tied to the but, main board, the, sorry, the logic board. But if that's the case, yeah. then this, and if this product is overlapping with performance wise with the other products, as you just showed us, then yeah. it's cannibalizing those other products. Uh, to me, that doesn't make sense unless it's the case that at Apple, those teams are kind of segregated and each team is responsible for getting as, as much gross profit on its product line I actually, the other, and they're competing teams. I doubt it works that way. I think Apple's a little bit smarter and a little bit more organized than that. I suspect that the only reason they wouldn't care about this cannibalizing their other products is that it's more profitable or as profitable. So ultimately it doesn't matter what you buy. Okay. Um, and I would suspect based on the loadout of something like an iMac Pro, I suspect that this is a higher margin product. Mm -hmm. uh, even if they are assembling it in the US as I, I think they had committed to doing. Don't quote me on that though. Okay. Uh, um, so so yeah, they just have a they just have a base amount of GP dollars that they need to make in order to make this product make sense for their shareholders, and well, screw you, you you get to buy a config that doesn't make any sense because remember too, imagine this, imagine if it didn't start at six thousand. Okay. Imagine if it started at a twelve. Thirteen thousand. Okay. People would be outraged about that too. And instead of it just being nerds like me that are gonna break down the spec and go, well, this is imbalanced, this doesn't make sense. Um, you know, you've effectively, you've effectively bought, you know, uh, um, that X Forma case that we showed, the like $1,300 case and, you know, put an entry level CPU and graphics card in it, like you're an idiot. You yeah. know, the, the people who are mad right now are the giant nerds. Whereas if they announced a product mm -hmm. that was that started at thirteen thousand dollars, everyone would be right, mad. Right, right. Their their like common customer would feel alienated. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Now it seems attainable, even though what you're buying is essentially stuff to throw away and upgrade later if you are intending to do any serious work with it. Okay. How about the monitor, though? Ah, uh, yeah, we can talk about the monitor. So. <laughs> I can't wait to see it. It's going to be a great monitor. 
Let's say that. It's going to be a great monitor. Oh, the monitor I'm pretty excited about, yeah. actually. Now, Brandon was actually telling me about um, a really interesting post that someone created where their main problem with the monitor was not necessarily its hardware capabilities, but whether or not Apple was going to adhere to any of the existing standards for HDR. Because if Apple comes in and says, okay, we're competing with the, the Flanders of the world, you know, we're talking 30,000 plus dollar displays, um, so, so this person's problem with it at that point was it doesn't have enough local dimming zones. It's going to have bloom. It's just, it's simply not suitable. Um, versus if Apple was coming in and they wanted to compete with sort of the, the more, the more average creation monitors, um, they were saying that, well, Apple needs to Apple needs to just be aware of and adhere to standards like HDR10 that already exist instead of you know forging their own path with this uh, what what do they call it XDR Extreme Dynamic Range or something like that I can't remember yeah, I exactly exactly what their wording was for it um, now I I think that with like Apple isn't perfect but they tend to be good at designing an end-to-end -end workflow. What I suspect is that right around the time this Mac Pro launches, they're going to have some new workflow tools within Final Cut, within Mac OS, that are going to make working with HDR content easier. And I think that they, they're going to have to acknowledge that there are standards like HLG, um, HDR10, uh, Dolby, Vision. Dolby Vision, that already exist and that they have to make their tools work for. I, I, I am not as pessimistic as um, that person was. But um, I also am not as well versed in it as they are, so I'm going to be really interested mm -hmm. to see how this how this goes and how long this display is even that interesting for. OLED only has to get a little bit brighter to make more sense, because remember, it's high dynamic range, not mm -hmm. necessarily how many nits you can pump through a display. Um, so OLED only has to get a little bit brighter before, for my, for myself, I'd rather be editing, I'd rather be creating on something that has no bloom. And 570, is it 576 zones? I don't 532? know. 532? I can't remember how many it was, but, um... On a 32 inch. Yeah, that's a lot of zones on a 32 inch, but it's sure as heck not an emissive display technology. I, we actually, we checked out mm -hmm. a display with uh, 512. 512 zones just on yesterday. On a 35 inch. On a 35 inch, and so it's not quite an apples to apples comparison, but would you say, based on what you saw, that Apple's 500 to 600 class display on a 32 inch is going to be sufficient for like real color accurate, contrast accurate color work? No, <laughs> it depends on... <laughs> okay. Well, it depends on the aggressiveness because on the display that you and I looked at, it yep. was which was the PG35B, sometimes known as BQ, um, it had such aggressive um, local dimming that it, there was always bloom and it was... You could really see when you move the cursor from one Wait. little one inch, one inch zone to another that it was... You missed when we were playing Tomb Raider, didn't you? Uh, I played it myself earlier, but I wasn't oh, you there. Did. I wasn't oh. there with you. Did you play any scenes with really high contrast? A little bit. Okay. I didn't notice any problems when I was gaming. Okay, because I was really impressed with how well it did when gaming. It was yeah. only when on the desktop it on sucked. The, on the, it, it, I think "sucked" is probably about the right word. Yeah. Yeah. It uh, sucked. Yeah. But all I'm saying is, like, a, even with that many zones, 500 zones in that size, they're still like. They, they were about an inch by an inch. still an inch by That's an inch. still pretty like, big. It's big, yeah. And Apple's is going to be smaller, but not that much smaller. Not that much smaller. No, like maybe 0.8 of an inch or like, 0.85 yeah. of an inch. By 10% point, smaller yeah. or something like yeah. that. Yeah, so, because remember too, we're talking about a 35 inch display, but it's a 35 inch 21 by nine display. That is not, in terms of actual display surface area, that's not as much bigger as it sounds compared to a 32 inch, um, is it 16 by nine? Nine or 10. I actually don't remember. Um, but even, you even see bloom on OLEDs. I think it just has to do with the perception of the eye though. That's true, that's true. You do see some bloom on OLEDs, but like you said, I think part of it is just. The eye's contrast capabilities. Yep. Um, and that's actually another thing. That's another reason why I do question how much brighter OLED really has to get 
for the HDR experience to be really, really good on it because we're already at the point now where the brightest whites on an OLED, right next to the blackest blacks, like my eye has a hard time seeing that line. Yeah. So if we want something like a, like a candle burning in the middle of a dark room, if we want it to bleed out, if that's the filmmaker's desired effect, I mean, are we that far off? I just don't know how much more our work is going to be put into OLED because it seems like micro LED is kind of looming in like the three to five year horizon now, and and Apple's one of the companies doing it. At They're least investing smaller. really heavily in it, yeah. as far as uh, as far as the public is aware, anyway. Yeah, I don't know how big of displays they're planning on making with it though. So, it's supposed to be pretty scalable, though, right? That's one of the uh, one of the selling points of micro LED, I believe, yeah. is that it's kind of like you can just scale it up or down. Now, this was a really fun conversation that I actually had with some of the folks at NVIDIA, and I don't believe, yeah, no, there's nothing about this that would have been off the record or NDA or anything like that, but I was, and pardon my ignorance, every once in a while I get something completely wrong. So I was under the impression that when we talk about micro-led technology, you know what, we really need to do our sponsor spots because yeah, we, uh, we, are, we are running out of time on the WAN show here today. So don't let, let me, let me get into that. What right a cliffhanger. Sponsors. Sorry guys, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not doing this to you just to like be a jerk or anything. Turn just, blue here. <laughs> Okay. Holding my breath, waiting for you. Sponsors are Honey. Join Honey.com and start saving on your internet shopping today. It's free. And those of you who downloaded Honey from our link have already saved over $100,000 in the past I few months. I forget what it was, but I bought a higher ticket item online recently and actually saved like 100 bucks because of Honey. Honey works on over 30,000 stores, including Amazon, eBay, Newegg, Razor, Best Buy, Walmart, and more. You might have heard of some of those stores. I mean, they're pretty small, small obscure stores. Yeah. Like Newegg and Amazon, Best Buy. Um, Honey gets a small commission from sites when they save you money, so you never pay for it. It's free to use and installs in just two clicks. Uh, so go check it out at joinhoney.com oh, slash wow. minus. Did we just lose power? What? Someone turned us off over here. Uh, hello? Can, uh, are we still streaming? I think we're still streaming. Uh, uh, now you guys can't see, but Linus is trying to kiss me right now. Uh, uh, no, I think it's the CASA module, hold Brandon. On, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Lights are turning on in the bedroom right now. Um, Lights are on behind me. Are we, are the camera we on? Off. Camera's on now. Camera's on. Can I kind of like this dark mode. Dark mode. Yeah, sorry, these lights take a little bit to turn back on, guys. Anyway, tell um, me a freaky story move on to that happened to a friend of a friend of yours. Pulseway. Pulseway is, the, is a real-time remote monitoring and management tool that lets you fix problems on the go by sending commands from any mobile device. It's compatible with Mac, Windows, and Linux, and Pulseway's single app gives you remote desktop functionality as well. You can get access to real-time status, system resources, logged in re users, network performance, Windows updates, and more, and you can create and deploy custom scripts to automate your IT tasks. It allows you to scan, install, and update all your systems on the go, and you can try it for free at pulseway.com or at the link in the video description. I love those guys, they have the best ads. Finally, we've got Rover. <laughs> Finally, we've got rover.com. Um, Rover.com lets you find qualified dog sitters, walkers, and even overnight care near you. You can arrange a quick meetup before booking and you can book through their website or the app. You can get photo updates to see how your pup is doing throughout their stay, and each sitter has received a background and identity check. It's backed with the Rover guarantee and 24 seven support from Rover.com if anything goes wrong. Just book through our affiliate link at lmg.gg slash WANROVER to get $10 off for first time users. Yeah. And it's, they're available in Canada because one of our people used it. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Very cool. All right. So let's go. What was I talking about? Dang it. You're about to tell me oh, yeah, the, the thing, thing about microLED. Okay. So every once in a while, I get something completely wrong, and microLED is one of them. Okay. So my first exposure to microLED in the real world was Sony's. Ah, it burns! That's pretty hot. That's pretty hot. I, is, there, is there a reason we don't just turn on the, uh, the normal ones? They're turning on, they just take like, Oh, are you minutes. sure? But I don't know if they're turning on. I don't know if they take 10 minutes. I think, yeah, yeah. We'd see them glowing by now. I don't think they're on. I'm happy with this, it looks cool. <laughs> yeah, all right. Dramatic. Um, 
So my first exposure to micro LED was- Although I'm not the one looking in the light. Um, was with the Sony Cletus display. Yep. And have you heard of the Cletus? Yeah, yeah, that was okay. at CES. Oh, did you it, see it? I wasn't there that year. But they okay. had it the next year, didn't they? Okay, so the Cletus display is really trippy because the way that it, it's like a modular display, and mm -hmm. we've seen technologies like this before, but it's a unique one because it's got these panels that are about this big, and then you just assemble them together into whatever size and resolution display you want. Now that's not unique. What's unique is that the Cletus display uses an emissive display technology like OLED, except it's not OLEDs, it's micro LEDs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they've got these tiny, tiny micro LEDs, red, green, and blue, and they emit directly from the display, so there's no backlight or anything like that, but the way that they achieve near perfect blacks on a Cletus display is that, I forget what the exact number is, but uh, it's, it's over- It's like made of black dots. No, 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 it's Isn't not. Isn't there like a bunch of black dots that you can see if you go really close to it? No. Is that like an illusion when you back up? Uh, it's a little bit different than that. So they actually allowed me to go up to it. Uh, here, I'm just. Yeah, I remember. Up the page everyone here. was uh, everyone was tense. I'm like, no, don't go that close. Okay, ultimate picture. Blah blah blah. Where is it? Okay. Uh, oh, where's the? Here we go. Okay, right. Because so the reason they can get nearly perfect blacks out of it is that. 99% of the Cletus display doesn't emit light. Weird. It's just, it's actually black. So you're looking at this giant display made that, that emits light, they're micro LEDs, they're super bright, but they're actually tiny. They're micro LEDs. And all of the area around them is just black. Are they clustered or are they spread out with lots of black in between? They look like this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so you've got a red, green, and a, it's either a blue or a yellow, I actually don't remember, but you've got three subpixels for each pixel, and the vast majority of the display is actually black. But because of the way that light spreads from a source, you actually have to get about 18 inches from the screen in order for, and it's weird, your eyes like go weird as you move through oh, the threshold. kind of click in. And then all of a sudden you go from seeing the entire image, which has no perceivable gaps in it, to seeing just these dots and they don't look like anything. They That's just look- That's so trippy. It's so weird. Okay. So I thought that micro LED displays were specifically this technology. Okay. I didn't ever stop and think about that a micro LED is just I think. A small LED, and yeah. you could do anything you wanted with it. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't think about that there were other ways that people were planning to use micro LEDs. Okay, so I was talking to NVIDIA because they were talking about these displays that they've, that they've created with over 500 um, local dimming zones. And they were talking about like, yeah, you know, we see a, a clear path forward, because I'd love wait, to wait, see- Wait, 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 which NVIDIA displays have over 500 dimming zones? Well, the one that we just checked out, for one. That's not NVIDIA. Well, okay. That was Asus. R okay. Are you, are you talking about the VFGDs? I'm talking about the NVIDIA driver module and the um, the full array backlight control module. That's oh, yeah. NVIDIA that okay, creates okay. that. Sure. Yeah. So, um, okay, that's actually an important point to clarify. So they were talking about how um, you know going from 384 zones to over 500 zones to using mini LEDs to micro LEDs. They see this very clear technology progression, whereas like. I love an OLED G-Sync display. And I was like, hey, you guys working on that? And they're kind of like, you know, they're vague, right? They're evasive. We're, we're working on everything. You know, what are we, we're a technology company. What are we not working? Like they basically, it was a not, total non-answer. And when I drilled down, um, where I ultimately, like they wouldn't answer any questions about it, but what I ultimately realized is that because OLED is an emissive display with completely different characteristics in terms of color mixing at different brightnesses, um, you know, making them color accurate, um, 
the way that the pixels switch or rather they they don't take a long time to switch like nvidia would have to completely reinvent the g-sync module i see to run an oled display so when they were talking about this clear path forward to mini led and micro led i totally misunderstood that they were talking about something like a cletus display right. an emissive display using micro leds what they were actually talking about was using micro leds to have a much greater degree of granularity in a full array backlit I see. Okay, so so what they're looking for as a business then is is evolution rather than revolution. It's like we have this tried and tested stuff. We just need to iterate to make it, you know, just do this but do it harder. So do what, it smaller, miniaturize it. So what I ultimately came away with was that full array backlighting on LCD displays is not going anywhere, and where we're probably headed is many, many, many more zones. Maybe where we get to the point where each zone is a mini LED or a micro LED so that the blooming becomes much less. I don't remember what my point was in all of this anymore. I think we were just talking about uh, micro LED coming out eventually. Oh, right. And Apple investing right. in it. Right, yes. So micro LED coming out eventually, yes. But maybe not in the form that you might think because a micro LED display could be an emissive display, or it could just be really, really small LEDs, micro LEDs, mm -hmm. behind a regular old LCD panel. So yes, micro LED displays are coming. We just don't know exactly what form they'll take. And after that meeting with NVIDIA, Why, I had a better understanding. It doesn't make sense to keep them as transmissive displays because when you have that many of them, well, it depends how many you have. If they're at almost the level of being like for each pixel, is a zone, then the beauty of it is that you turn it off and you get the, the black levels of OLED. Yes. Right? And the pixel response times, because the reason that LCDs have higher pixel response times than OLED is that it because actually takes time the for the liquid layer. crystal to twist. That takes time and to untwist. Yes. And that's also related to why it's not as black, because even when it's fully twisted, some light's still going to get through. So why would you give up on all those awesome benefits? Because you've invested the last 25 years in LCD. Then get disrupted. And you know how they work. Get disrupted. That, but that's it, because you know how they work. Because a lot of the time you can build, even using an inferior technology, you can build a better display when you understand the technology at play better. And so yes, get disrupted, but the flip side of that is <laughs> Apple's display is already sort of groundbreaking in terms of its contrast and peak brightness and all that. The thing is, the thing is six thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So, but so is a BFGD. What's the emissive one going to be? That's exactly my point. How disruptive is that technology going to be if it costs hmm. fifty grand or whatever? You know what I mean? Well, they should eventually. It depends. They could end up in phones. It'd be great in your watch. Yes. You know, and I wonder if LG. I, I'm sure LG is also um, investing in it. It's just kind of interesting because they also are going so hard into OLED, but they don't want to be the caught flat-footed either, right? No one wants to be caught flat-footed. I think LG is still pretty heavily invested in OLED. Only time will tell. So we promised in the video thumbnail that we were gonna talk about not just the monitor, but also the monitor stand. What monitor stand? The one for the- The one it doesn't come one. with? Yeah, the one it doesn't, the one it doesn't <laughs> come with. So I guess the argument here is that like the very expensive, very, yeah. very expensive monitors that you referenced earlier, yeah. uh, those don't come with stands either. And it's just not, in, like in that category, it's not industry standard to pr have a stand. Hey, Brandon, yeah. can you bring me something that's really stupidly overpriced? Uh, like a, a, a handle or something, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, Brandon's gonna find this something This is gonna for be us. something related to a red, for Okay, sure. so, can I play devil's advocate for a moment here? Please. I love Satan. Okay, so there's a... <laughs> you got something for me? I have two things. Okay, this. yeah, that, yeah, or what else you got? How much is this? 12.95 for two. This is 12.95 for two? Okay, wonderful. Uh, how much is this? $2,950. Is that still how much it costs? Yeah. US okay. or Canadian? US. Okay. Three grand US. All right. Um, this is three grand. Okay, so we got a, we got a couple, we got a couple things here. Okay, so... When I buy a product, my understanding is that it should come with pretty much everything that it needs to function, right? Okay. Okay, that's a very consumer-centric point of view. Now, 
I would say that if I were to if I were to graph out the now that now that I have experience in the professional world, if I were to graph out my expectation of like a cost versus included accessories curve, okay, I would say as the cost approaches zero, your included accessories go down. You expect a more bare bones experience. So, as the cost approaches zero. As the cost of my original purchase approaches zero. So if I buy the cheapest phone on the market, I'm not that surprised it doesn't come with some headphones. Okay. Right? Okay. Then, as I, as I step up in cost, I expect my experience to be more and more complete. And when you buy something like a Galaxy S10, um, you know, it's got your... UPS on here. Do we yeah, not? we do. Theoretically, we're live, but the camera's dead. Can you can you guys can you guys make sure the camera is going to turn back on? on. Oh yeah, back. camera's on. Okay, nice. we just. I'm sorry, guys. We just had we just had a short blackout. It's called a brownout. Uh, no, no, it's called a brownout when it doesn't actually. Cut. Oh, when it just goes. Vroom. Yeah. Um, a short blackout. Yeah. Wow. We have to have a good name for that. Hey guys. A mini blackout. Um, sorry, what was I talking about? Right. You were describing an inverted pa yeah. parabola. Okay. Yeah. So, so basically, you know, I expect to get my my you know my headphones and and they'll run bundles and stuff. So maybe yeah, it sure. comes with a micro SD card for expansion and blah 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 and, and a fast charger, a fast charger. You know, like yep. accessory bundles. Okay. Well, unless it's an iPhone. Yeah. And then as I spend more. That starts to go down. And I get again. into professional grade rather than consumer grade gear. The manufacturer's expectation is that if you only have a little bit to spend, you expect very little. If you have a moderate amount of money to spend, you expect a lot. And if you have a lot of money to spend, you probably don't care about the crap we were going to include anyway. And you're willing to pay more for a premium, perfect option. So I think there's a certain level of F you, you've got the money anyway, pay more that goes on when it comes to professional products. I don't think they products. would say that. I think they would say that. No, they wouldn't say because it. Every, because each piece is ostensibly so highly engineered and high quality and so expensive. You don't And low want, volume. You don't want to be paying for things you don't need. That would be the way they would say it. They wouldn't say F you, yeah. but it's just implied. But... If that were really the case, if they're really being altruistic, then there wouldn't be a two hundred dollar Vesa adapter. It would. It would just be Vesa. standard. It, you could just clip it on there. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about then. So again, playing playing a little bit of devil's advocate here. I don't think that Apple has missed the mark with their audience at all. We are talking about a. You don't think they're outra outraging the same person they were afraid of to outrage when we talked about the lower level? I think they're going to outrage people, but I don't think those were the customer for this product at all. We're talking about a six thousand dollar monitor. Once you get the anti glare special etched glass coating, we're talking about a six thousand dollar machine that it hooks up to. At that point, it is an eight percent difference in cost to get the pro stand. Hmm. Or just, or, or what percentage is that? Or, or we're talking like a 1.75% difference in cost to get a vase amount. Right. 1.5%, that's all we're talking well, about. Well, $200 is nothing. People, people who can afford that pee the, the $200. A grand? N not necessarily. Maybe they don't pee it, but maybe they can make that $200 back because this is a tool that they use for actual work. So I paid, how much did I pay for this? Uh, the that handle. 1200 bucks for two. $1,200. For two? For, well, yeah, like a pair, it's a set of two. A pair is $1,200, yeah. okay. So I paid $600 for this. Let's break it down a little bit. Uh, here's a piece of machined aluminum. Here's a screw. Here's a little aluminum doohickey that you can twist. Uh, here's a button. Another aluminum doohickey. Um, here's a little adjusty doohickey with another little doodad on it. Um, here's a rubber let's handle. Let's go, let's go. Okay, so $600. <laughs> but I did this because there's nothing else on the market that has the, the same level of ergonomics and build quality that allows us to operate the camera more comfortably. So effectively, I'm not buying 
some stupid aluminum doohickey. I'm buying a the camera. Solution. I'm buying a camera operator whose back doesn't need Cairo appointments every week. That ultimately my company's health plan is going to pay for. That's what I'm buying. So it's a different perspective, and when it comes to legitimate professional level gear, I'm not talking about an iPad Pro. That's not professional equipment. A MacBook Pro is not professional equipment anymore. People are doing real work on them, but Apple has sullied that product line. They have made it about a status symbol that you can use to browse Facebook. Hot take. More than just about actually getting real work done and delivering the best possible performance. Now, my thoughts may change when I, I actually haven't watched our review of the upcoming eight core MacBook Pro. So I'm basing it on the one that thermal throttled last. Apparently it's a lot better. Um, but I'm talking about actual tools that actual professionals will buy to actually make money with them. It's a different equation when you make money with something that you buy. At least cognitively, you can justify it. Sure. Also, if you make more money with it, then objectively, mm -hmm. it's a good investment. Well. Hey, do you know how much employee healthcare costs? <laughs> 600 bucks, <laughs> whatever. Or like, or like if someone quit, because I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't, couldn't provide the, the ergonomic equipment that they need to not be in pain. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know how much it costs to train a person? Mm -hmm. We're talking thousands and thousands of dollars in lost produ productivity. What, this makes them happy? Pfft. All right. Hmm. What do I care? Well, well I want a better chair. I'm what just, what just, chair do you have now? I'm just joking, actually. Okay. All right. I have had a really nice Herman Miller before at work. It was pretty cool. Should we wrap it up? Is that it? Super chats? Can we do some super chats? Oh, we should really do some super chats. Um, you, just for YouTube's sake. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Here, YouTube. Here's your. Here, let's find the let's find the most expensive uh, super chat. YouTube, can we get some? Here you go, YouTube. Here's thirty bucks uh, from Tynan Dugdal. Hey, Linus. Paradox Interactive of CK2 EU4 made a music video for their upcoming Paradox Con. Will we get a music video for LTX? <laughs> Will we get a music video for LTX? I have to confess, I had not given that one nanosecond of thought. Well, I can imagine us having footage from LTX placed over music, or with music, and released as promotional material for the next one, but I don't think we're gonna choreograph any dancing or get any sexy people in bikinis. We could put us in bikinis. Is that something I can make you I guys said do? sexy people in bikinis. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're sexy, aren't we? Compared to what, Linus? Uh, BH Prototyping <laughs> says, would you ever consider fully building an entire production grade computer case from scratch for a video in the future? Um, absolutely, in fact. We're doing that wood one. Um, are we? You okayed the wood, the wood case. Did I? Did I okay making it from scratch? No. Okay. Um, actually, yeah, that is something that we would consider doing. Um, it would have to be the right project. I mean, we have designed cases from scratch before. My personal rig is in a completely custom designed case that was built by Protocase. Um, Anthony Berg, hi. Joseph Thornier, hi. Chad, hi. Hey, Chad. Blame the dingus. More free super chat, thank you. Um, JR Andrew Mosspack says, do you think Apple will lock out the PCI ports? I sincerely hope that they don't, um, at least not directly. I think what Apple will do is they will limit the availability of drivers for devices to ones that they want plugged into those PCIe ports. Just like they do with the Blackmagic eGPU. Exactly. Just like you can't plug an NVIDIA graphics card into a MacBook because Apple will not okay the drivers. To be clear, I actually had someone complaining um, in the comments on the Mac Pro video where I appeared to be blaming Apple for the rift between Apple and NVIDIA. To be clear, I don't. I suspect that between NVIDIA and Apple, you've got the two biggest egos in the entire industry and it's no wonder they can't get along and it's probably equal parts both of their fault. Actually, it's probably more NVIDIA's fault because they, they screwed Apple pretty good on those dying GPUs back in the day. Uh, Carpentry says, Canadian dollars for the merch store, please. Uh, sorry, it's not going to happen anytime soon. The vast majority of our audience is um, in the US. And the ones that aren't, quite frankly, aren't in Canada either. And the US dollar is kind of the international currency. Blame Shopify. We can't have multiple currencies. Oh, apparently it's Shopify's fault. We can't have multiple currencies on it. I'll double check, but I think. 
Oh, wow. We just called. You made me call out Shopify and you haven't double checked it. Yeah. Dang it, Nick. Uh, so you're saying you don't care. So you're saying you're rich, so you don't care. No, I'm saying that I use these products to make money. Think about it this way. You don't, you can apply the same logic to anything. As a, as a parent whose kids won't use it very often, I could say a $75 radio flyer wagon is very expensive and I'm not going to buy one. But if my, if my son were to say, I'm going to get a job delivering newspapers, I can deliver newspapers 30% faster with a radio flyer wagon. I could make back that money in seven days of delivering newspapers. Now it's not expensive. It costs the exact same amount of money. It's just a matter of measuring that amount that it costs against the ROI that it delivers for the business. It's a different calculation. It doesn't necessarily mean that you don't care about what the cost is. It just means that there are other factors at play. Price is an arbitrary measure of value. So if your value, if you value it differently than someone else does because of your circumstances, then um, Scott says you crashed YouTube with last week's WAN show. Actually, this is two WAN shows in a row that they haven't managed to process correctly. So my intention today is to kill the live stream and then re-upload it as a VOD. Because they promised me it's not going to happen again, but they also couldn't offer an explanation as to why it happened last week and why it took an entire week for them to uh, fix it. Tyler Gaming says, I'm a Linux user. Ha 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 Enjoy your very limited suite of creative professional software like come on it's not that simple you know that um tommy gun says how's the 100k pc and personal rig doing my personal rig's great james helped me upgrade it again yesterday so i'm super stoked on that and 100k pc we have a video coming very soon we shot that this week um okay i think i'm gonna call that it thank you very much ladies and gentlemen and we will see you again next week same bat time same bat channel oh i am blur 20 bucks sorry i will i will answer you do you know of a two-in-one or a convertible laptop with pen support for drawing that can also game at approximately medium settings? Wow. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't count on finding that. I would more look for something that has a good drawing surface that has Thunderbolt, and I would use an eGPU uh, when, you're, when you're gaming. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Um, or I would wait for, oh, I would wait for, wait, what? I would wait for... Uh, 10th gen, they're going to have better onboard graphics. Alex P.A. Prime from our editing team <laughs> sent a super chat asking if this is a conflict of interest. Sending the super chat. What are you even... For $2. Why are you even... Is sending... I'm reporting him. I'm putting the user <laughs> in timeout. There, timeout. Timeout, is A. That... Prime. No. <laughs> All right, bye, guys. <laughs> oh, wait, what the, what the deuce? Rover. Yeah, Rover apparently gets the whole thing. Rover. Red Rover. Red False way, Rover. honey. Oh. Us again. Uh, oh. Part of the intro. It's dead. And, and bye. And it's gone.